All right. Up next, we have Blue Elephants, JP and Ashish Jain. Um, let's welcome them today. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the Blue Elephant Capital presentation. I'm Ashish Jain, one of the managing partners of Blue Elephant. Today, we want to talk about the institutional edge in platform lending and how we think about this market through the lens of a fixed income trader. By background, I traded fixed income securities and derivatives for the last 10 years. I first traded at Lehman Brothers and was there through the bankruptcy. I moved to Barclays, spent a year in London trading Euro-denominated structured notes before making my way back to New York and Nomura. I worked with JP first at Lehman Brothers and then later again at Nomura. My interest in this space began in 2007. I opened a Prosper account and started buying loans. So I had a front, and front seat to how these loans performed during the crisis and was happy to say that even had a positive performance through the default cycle. That said, I was invested in some of the higher grade quality loans and that's some of the thinking that actually influences the way that we manage uh, investor capital at Blue Elephant. To me, this asset class had always looked like an asset-backed security at the loan level. Fast forward to 2012, we decided to take a closer look at this asset class as it started to become a little bit more institutionalized and had some of the pieces that we thought would be important from a fiduciary perspective. I left Nomura in late 2011 and began to really spend more time in this part of the space. JP and I decided to take a real crack at it. The, the space was growing and we thought we could put together a fund that would provide excellent risk return to our investor base, especially given the current fixed income environment. During early 2013, we set up the institutional infrastructure and formally launched our fund, the Blue Elephant Consumer Fund. I'll let JP walk you through his background and give his perspective on the market. He's a seasoned trader having been in the market for 20 plus years. JP? Can I put this in here? Okay. Thanks, Ashish. Um, by way of background, I spent 22 years on the fixed income sell side, both trading and, and uh, managing. 15 years at Lehman Brothers, five years at Bank of America, and two years at Nomura. The products I managed most closely were the rates complex with emphasis on US treasuries, agencies, derivatives, mortgage pass-throughs, lots of inflation product, and non-dollar sovereign product. I also spent many years managing the funding businesses at both Bank of America and Nomura, where I gained valuable experience uh, in the uh, credit markets as well. My longest and most rewarding stretch, however, of, of my career was trading the 10-year sector of the Treasury curve at Lehman Brothers for five years back in the mid to late 90s. It was here in this uh, chaotic and high volume, high risk sector where I saw daily the, macro the uh, macroeconomic variables drive valuations in real time. From those trading days forward, I have remained a student of the, of the, uh, of the macro fixed income complex. And at Blue Elephant, we continue to use these macro variables to help us drive not only the quality of the credit we want in the fund, uh, at any given time, but also what the appropriate le uh, levels of leverage should be in the, uh, in the portfolio uh, given the, the macroeconomic backdrop. Further, unlike traditional fixed income where prices and valuations react instantaneously to changes in variables such as inflation, unemployment, Fed bias, et cetera, valuations and delinquencies in the, uh, in the platform finance assets will take much longer to react to shifting trends in the macro landscape giving us time to position the portfolio for larger macroeconomic trend changes. The macro indicator uh, sheet that you see here shows a sampling of some of the, the variables we follow closely at Blue Elephant to help us assess key economic trends and overall health in the consumer and broader credit uh, markets. We've been talking for a long time, Ashish and I now, about how the majority of economic forecasts continue to underestimate the domestic strength and, and, and potential GDP. The trending, the, 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 uh, the trending variables in this slide strengthen our argument. With QE winding down, Treasury rates have moved substantially higher from the beginning of 2013, and, and the, uh, the yield curve has steepened substantially 
uh, with two, the two-year, five-year part of the curve out about 75 basis points, which is a substantial steepening in percentage terms. If you look at the forward curves as well, it's even more pronounced with uh, the two-year rate, two-year forwards moving 100 basis, 150 basis points since 2013, which, was, which is a huge jump. At the same time, if you look at credit spreads all the way down the credit curve to high yield, they have compressed greatly uh, since the beginning of 2013, which is a really he healthy sort of fundamental sign given the backdrop of, uh, of this QE exit. And lastly, if you look at inflation expectations, um, they've also come down meaningfully uh, over the same period, which further points to a uh, more, sustainable, more sustainable real GDP growth path forward. So I guess against this backdrop, we like getting to our one and a half to two times leverage target as quickly as we can. And uh, we th also think that we could probably maintain it there for some time. Thanks, JP. So just digging a little bit deeper as to how we, how we look at this, this complex and, and how we get comfortable with, with the different assets, we just wanted to walk you through kind of our, our process. So JP went through our macroeconomic view. So that, for us, is really the key variable on how we think about these assets. Now, as I mentioned, I had opened my account in 2007. And one of the things that I found is that the volatility or the, the real risk of your higher grades going into default naturally is much less than the lower grades, especially in a bad credit cycle. So if you look at today, we're in probably the most benign credit cycle that we've ever experienced. Um, you know, credit card default rates generally run at 4%, and they're running at sub 1%. So by all kind of historic measures, um, and now again, you know, Prosper Lending Club have only been around for a little bit, but credit card and, and FICO score uh, analysis have been along for, for a very long time. We're at absolutely the best time for credit. But what this means is you have three and five year paper. And so to us, it's not clear that in a downturn, how well some of the, the lower grades will really perform. And if you look at you know, kind of what the historic expected returns have been for your Lending Club and Prosper uh, paper, they're all relatively close. But I think risk adjusted, um, you know, we don't, at Blue Elephant, we don't believe you're actually getting paid to go down the capital structure over the term of, uh, of that loan. So with that in mind, and, and given the experience that we had, we said, well, if that's our belief, how do we generate the right risk reward return? So the piece that we've done is so we have a leveraged fund. Um, and so we uh, just closed on a bank facility to take our uh, Prosper loans and apply leverage against them. Again, we feel comfortable uh, in this, given that we're playing in the highest credit quality space. And this is something that's very difficult for an individual to do. So all of you can go and, and buy Prosper loans or Lending Club loans. But unless you're willing to take out maybe a home equity loan or something uh, you know, against a secured asset, putting leverage on, on your portfolio is very difficult. And now all leverage isn't created equal. So a lot of times people ask us, well, hey, you're putting some leverage on. Isn't that risky? And we say, of, of course, there's added risk anytime you add leverage. But we want to think about this leverage a little bit differently. So some things you, you may be familiar with is buying a stock on margin. They said, well, hey, that's risky. You know, you could, you could lose everything. And we say, well, how do, we, how do we think about that? And we say, well, one, your stock has a daily mark to market. So even if you're right and you buy something at 100 and it goes to 150, if you bought it on margin at some point along the way, it hit 25, you're out, right? You got the trade right, you did everything right, and you earned zero. So we say, OK, well, why is that? Well, what's your term of your leverage? And the term on your margin account is one day. So even if that happens over the course of one or two days, and it sits at 25, and you can't come up with the money, your broker is going to sell your stock. So what we have is a term facility. So we have a two-year facility against these assets. So that gets us a little bit more comfortable. You know, another way to think about it for any of you who have uh, owned your home through uh, uh, the 2008 crisis, um, as long as you made your payments, your banks didn't come knocking on your door to repossess your house because you failed your initial LTV, right? So you may not have been able to refinance when you wanted, but no one took away your asset. 
So again, that's how when we think about the leverage, we, we think about it in a structural way, and that's what gives us comfort that from a risk reward perspective, that this really is uh, the, the best way to go. Now the second piece we talk about is, well, with leverage, you want to make sure you're playing the right part of the credit curve. So we've kept it to, again, the very highest grades, um, and we've got a 55% uh, allocation to the, uh, in the three-year space and a 45% allocation to the five-year space. In terms of the portfolio, um, and, and we, again, we think about risk and, and return kind of broadly, you know, the first thing that we think about is how do you manage your cash drag? So anytime you're investing in these, in these platforms or in these assets, you know, you're earning zero while you're in cash effectively, and how do you deploy that? So we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we bring assets into the fund, how do we deploy them, you know, what's the cancellation rates on some of these platforms in terms of actually, be, actually getting your assets to work. Because that's, again, another driver of performance. We talked a lot about the leverage ratio, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that uh, um, as it is. Um, but naturally, we also manage the credit risk. So right now, we've talked about a one and a half to two times leverage on the highest credit risk. Well, as the macroeconomic conditions change, the first thing we would do is bring down our leverage ratio. And the second thing we would do is we would move up the credit curve. So those are the two ways that we're really reacting to data um, you know, before we're really going to hit uh, the, this, uh, the real delinquency and default rates. And as, as JP mentioned, you know, in liquid markets, you know, one data point re can reprice an entire security. Here, there's a little bit more lag, a little bit more time. Uh, so even though you can't really go out and sell the securities, you're able to rebalance your portfolio in a way that really can protect you from the downside. Um, you know, and one of the things that we've seen is, again, all of these platforms have done very well. We're, we're very bullish on the sector, but we haven't really gone through another credit cycle since 08, and, th and the volumes that we did see were relatively light. Now, again, we think that they'll fare pretty well because um, uh, of the way that their underwriting is done, et cetera, but we'd rather just be a little extra sure and, and take some precaution uh, in the way we think about it. So in terms of risk management, um, so I guess I would, I would break down risk management in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first one, which you probably hear the most about, is kind of your financial metrics, right? So what's my credit risk? What's my interest rate risk? What's my duration risk? Um, for us, there's also, you know, what's my asset liability mix, right? Because we want to keep a relatively uh, matched asset to uh, liability, which is, which is our leverage, and think about, well, how do I manage those for the portfolio and for our investors? The second piece is liquidity. So for investors who do this on their own, you're subject to the natural liquidity of the loans. Um, uh, in the whole loan space in which we play, there really isn't that liquidity uh, today. Uh, there are some outlets for securitization, but largely I think you'd say that the, the, you know, the asset class isn't ready or doesn't have a good liquidity parameter. So the way we manage it is through um, uh, just the roll off. The other piece around risk is really the risk of the servicer. So again, we've got a lot of great companies here. We're, we're really bullish on the sector. We're buying uh, our loans from Prosper and Funding Circle, and, and I suspect you know, we'll, we'll grow that over time. But we need to put up a backup servicer in place. Um, again, these are great companies uh, across the space here, but we really want to make sure that we're doing the right thing from a fiduciary perspective to say, okay, if one of these guys don't make it, um, you know, do we have something in place? And um, you know, we think we've got the right, uh, the right platforms today to, to really do that, but we want to just be, again, a little extra careful, really manage the risk, and um, uh, make sure that uh, you know, it's going to be a good kind of uh, performance for, for our investors. From the fund perspective, um, you know, we've had kind of consistent returns, probably largely in line right now with what you've seen uh, on the platform themselves. We didn't really bring in leverage into the fund until January 1st of this year. Um, you know, we think uh, kind of April and May we'll start to see our returns tick up. Uh, closer to, you know, maybe the 12 to kind of 14 percent area. Um, but uh, as, as many of us know or, or have been invested in this product, it's, it has very consistent cash flows. Uh, we like the monthly amortization uh, of 
both you know our small business loans as well as our consumer loans, and uh, you know that helps us uh, both from rebalancing the book as well as from managing our liquidity. Um, and I think with that, I'll, I'll just you know just quickly recap. You know, for for us at Blue Elephant, having come from the fixed income side, you know we really place a lot of emphasis on the macro space, and and the reason we do that. Um, is we think that the highest quality credits are going to perform even through uh, an economic cycle. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about our leverage. We spend a lot of time thinking about risk, both from a portfolio perspective, as well as from a uh, uh, you know a more macro perspective in, in relationship to you know other things that can go wrong and what can we do to to put the right safeguards in place. Um, and overall, I'd say you know we're we're very encouraged by you know the the trajectory of of this asset class and, as well as it to uh, to continue to grow. We've met a lot of great companies here, and we think uh, there'll be a lot more to do. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll open it to questions, um, and we can go from there. Thank you. Uh, the question was, if there was a secondary market, how would that change your business? For us. It would allow us to rebalance our portfolio much more quickly. So the way we rebalance our portfolio today is uh, the way we buy new loans. So for example, if we want to move up the credit curve, we let our, our cash roll off and we'll go buy the higher grade loans or vice versa. Uh, as cash rolls off, we'll go, go down the credit curve. Um, also from a redemption perspective, uh, again, a lot of our investors having been through uh, the financial crisis put, put a heavy weight on liquidity and being able to you know, access their funds when they need it. Um, and that's one piece where, again, with the secondary market, that we can provide greater liquidity than we do today. Because, again, at the end of the day, whether you're structured as a fund or you own it individually, you're subject to the underlying tenor of the assets that you're buying. So you won't get your last dollar until that last five-year loan matures. Um, so the question is, what's my view on investing in non-U.S. platforms? Um, you know, we've looked at it, but we haven't really done our homework on it, to be honest. Uh, you know, the domestic market has been pretty, uh, pretty robust. Um, we have put in place the ability to kind of hedge currency risk in our fund. So, um, you know, should we want to take on kind of non-dollar assets, we can do that. But there's, you know, a fair amount of also legal work for us to do to kind of understand, you know, what are the right, you know, what are the, what are even the legal structures that would govern those assets, et cetera. So we, we just haven't done the homework to to really to think intelligently about it. 